Welcome everyone. Let me see all the books start in about five minutes. So let people find the link and join. Feel free to ask questions in chat. participate as much as you uh, Christian and Victoria, let's uh, turn on your cameras and check your microphones while they are eating. Hey there. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. I'll make it just a bit louder for myself. Hey, Victoria, say something. Hi, nice to <laughs> see everyone. Nice to see you too. Hi. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, Moksh. Hi, Alan. Hi, Kadambari. Hi, Alexander. I see Anthony and Joy here as well. Yes. I hope we will see more wild speeds. Thank you. Now we will start. Yes, lots of people were asking amazing questions during chat. Hi, Kadambari. Hello, hello, hello. Actually, those of you who can turn on their cameras, uh, Moksh, Jonathan, Ilan, could you please, Arya, do that so we'll just see each other just maybe for a minute or two. Hello, 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 everyone. One more minute and we will start. And we will have some um, breaks as well to stretch during our two hour long session. Okay, one more minute left. Yeah. Okay. Time to join. This is the first time for some people. Okay. We'll have a little bit less people right now than in our morning session because for some people it's midnight already. like Rabia and her students who came from Pakistan. Uh, it, it's, it's like really late there, some people from India, it's really late there. And so people from Singapore that joined us in the morning, it's also pretty late there. Okay, so let's start. Christian and Victoria, welcome. Yes, Simok, it's really late in India right now. Lots of people went to sleep. Please introduce yourself and let's go. Okay. 
Hi everyone, um, my name is Victoria and our group is called the Exoplanet Seekers. Um, I'm from Los Angeles, California, and I currently study astrophysics at UC Berkeley. Um, so I also have a really strong interest and passion for astrobiology. So that's why I'm here today. Um, Christian, do you wanna go? Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Christian. I'm currently studying physics. Yeah, I love physics, I love science. And I guess you love too. Uh, I'm from Mexico. And yeah, right now I'm researching for radiation, what, which materials we can use to stop radiation and so that doesn't affect astronaut health. And yeah, we'll see that it's pretty important for coming missions to Mars and to the moon. So yeah, feel free to ask during the session, everything you wanna know. Oh yeah, I and also, oh sorry. I, I just forgot to mention that my research project with BMSIS is um, a bioinformatics project. So I'm studying, um, I'm, I'm studying this one enzyme that's involved in carbon fixation in um, life here on Earth, and then I'm connecting that to the origin of carbon in the universe. So that's what my project is about. If you guys have any interest, also please let me know, and I'll answer any questions. So welcome, Exoplanet Seekers. Let's have fun today. So the first thing we're going to do is a really quick icebreaker. Um, I'm going to drop this link in the chat. Um, but basically, it, this is a Padlet. So you, if everyone can access the link, it's really easy. But basically, the question is, what is your favorite planet? Um, it doesn't have to be in our solar system, but it also can be. Um, so Christian said his favorite one is Saturn. Um, so how you do this is you click the little red plus in the bottom right corner. And then on the title, you can put your name. Um, um, and then my favorite planet is um, probably Saturn because I like the rings of Saturn. So yeah, that's how you do it. Um, we can take a few minutes to just uh, populate the board with our answers. Um, yeah. Also, we also if, talk about moons or just planets? Um, today, uh, today hey. we'll be talking about some moons in our solar system as well. Oh, as an answer for what is your favorite planet. Oh, yeah, sure. You can also put a moon. Mox says Earth, Aria says Earth. A lot of Earth fans here. <laughs> Kadambari says they like Jupiter. Alexander likes Saturn. Elon likes Triton and Earth. We'll give it just like one or two more minutes. Joy likes, oh, Travis won. It's almost like she saw what our presentation is gonna be about. <laughs> Okay, let's give it one more minute. Christian, what's your reason for liking Saturn? Well, my favorite two planets are Saturn and Earth. And Earth, but yeah, I think I really like Saturn because the mission, I guess you all know that mission is called the Cassini Huygens. And yeah, I love the way that it was. It, it, it makes you feel part of that mission. 
So yeah, I, I learned about that. I already made some essays about that. And yeah, just Saturn and their moons, for example, Titan, they are also incredible. Um, yeah, that, that's why I love Saturn. There's, there are some possibilities for life to exist there. And we'll see. Uh, maybe we won't see, but yeah, hopefully we, we will discover something in the near years. I agree. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying um, we should move on now, but thank you all for adding your answers. I'll leave it open in case you didn't get a chance to add and you still want to add it. Um, but yeah, okay, now back to the presentation. So astrobiology is about the origin of life in the universe, just life in the universe in general. So first, uh, we wanted to define what life really is. Um, so there's seven characteristics um, generally that are kind of agreed on, but still really debated um, about what defines life. So they are that it's made of cells, that it can reproduce, metabolize, um, maintain homeostasis, um, have a sensitivity to their environment, um, growth, as well as um, adaptation over time. So just to explain these a little more, the first one is that it's made of cells. So all living things are made of cells, which are the building block of life. So an example would be um, humans and animals. Um, your dog is made of cells. Um, you're made of cells, but rocks and water would be a non-example because they're just made of atoms and chemicals and um, they're not made of cells. So rocks and water are not alive. Um, the second one is reproduction. So living things have the ability to produce offspring. Um, so an example is a cat having kittens. Um, and a cat is alive, the kittens are alive. A non-example would be a copier. Um, a copier can make copies and copy things, but it's not alive. So the next one is metabolism. Um, an example, a metabolism is basically um, living things. They eat things and then they break down their food and turn it and take the nutrients and then turn it into energy and then release the waste. So you all eat and use the bathroom, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, an example would be a cow eating grass um, and digesting it. A non-example would be a reaction between sodium metal and chlorine gas, which releases energy and uses energy, but it makes something that's not alive. It just makes table salt. Um, next is homeostasis. This is basically an organism's ability to maintain constant internal conditions um, despite the external environment. So an example of this is when humans are in a really hot environment, um, they release sweat, which helps them cool down. So that's an example of humans maintaining homeostasis. A non-example would be, um, well, when you go to the beach, uh, it's usually, you usually find that the temperature outside is way hotter than the water. Um, and when you jump in, it's super cold. So the ocean, it remains super cold, even though it's really hot outside. Um, hot outside and there's a temperature difference, but the ocean and the air is not technically alive. Um, okay, next is sensitivity. So living things are able to react to their environment um, when there's a change in the environment. So an example is if you turn a light on, um, moths might flock to the light because they're really attracted to light. Um, that's an example of life having sensitivity. A non-example would be ice melting because it's hot. And that's a response to the change in environment, but ice cubes are not alive. Next is growth. So living organisms, they are able to grow stronger and taller and develop more as it keeps on living. So an example is a baby growing inside a mommy's belly. Um, a non-example would be snow piling up um, when it snows. The snow is not alive, but it is growing. 
And then lastly, adaptation over time. So organisms, um, they over long periods of time, they have adaptations and changes um, in their genes through mutations, um, which changes their physical characteristics over long, long periods of time. Um, so there's um, evolution pretty much. Uh, an example would be mosquitoes. Actually, they adapted to be resistant to um, a lot of pesticides um, over time because the mutation to survive against the pesticide um, was passed on through generations. Um, so that's life having adaptations. A non-example would be new versions of the iPhone coming out um, to adapt to new demands. Um, so yeah, those are the seven characteristics. Um, as you can see individually, um, having one of these characteristics doesn't make something alive. It's the sum of all of the parts that makes it alive. And like I said, the requirements or the definition of life is still really heavily debated. Um, so now here, just to recap and to help you guys remember those characteristics, uh, we're going to watch a quick video. Um, it's a song about the characteristics of living things. Brainy songs. Tune into learning. I was out in the park the other day when a huge green blob got in Sorry. my way. It slid so fast and then stopped still. Then I asked myself, does it eat? Does it poop? Does it grow, breathe, and move? Can it make more of its kind of you pork? It does it mind, does it eat? Does it poop? Does it grow, breathe, and move? If it does all these things, it's alive. I pressed my ear against the blob. I couldn't find its chest or even its gob. I listened for ages and then gave up. And I asked myself, does it eat? Does it poop? Does it grow, breathe, and move? Can it make more of its kind if you poke it? Does it mind? Does it eat? Does it poop? Does it grow, breathe, and move? If it does all these things, it's alive. Eating, pooping, growing, moving, breathing, reacting, reproducing, eating, pooping, growing, moving, breathing, reacting, reproducing, eating, pooping, growing, moving, breathing, reacting, Producing these are the seven signs of life. I think it's getting bigger and I started to shake, but the blob didn't feed or seem awake. I poked it with a stick and it didn't react. And I asked myself, does it eat? Does it poop? Does it grow, breathe, and move? Can it make more of its kind if you poke it? Does it mind? Does it eat? Does it poop? Does it grow, breathe, and move? If it does all these things, it's alive. Eating, pooping, growing, moving, breathing, acting, reproducing, eating, pooping, growing, moving, breathing, acting, reproducing, eating, pooping, growing, moving, breathing, reacting, reproducing. These are the seven signs of life. Didn't sleep well at all that night. The blob was in my dreams, it must have been fright. It was gone when I looked the very next day, and I asked myself, does it eat, does it poop, does it grow, breathe, and move? Can it make more of its kind if you poke it? Does it mind, does it eat, does it poop, does it grow, breathe, and move? If it does all these things, it's alive. Does it eat, does it poop, does it grow, breathe, and move? Can it make more of its kind if you poke it? Does it mind, does it eat, does it poop, does it grow, breathe, and move? If it does all these things, it's alive. Eating, pooping, growing, moving, breathing, acting, reproducing. Eating, pooping, growing, moving, breathing, acting, reproducing. Eating, pooping, growing, moving, breathing, acting, reproducing. These are the seven sides of life. Eating, pooping, growing, moving, breathing, acting, reproducing. Eating, pooping, growing, moving, breathing, acting, reproducing. Eating, pooping, growing, moving, breathing, reacting, reproducing. Seven sides of life. Okay, I think that's 
a good place to stop. Um, I hope that helps you all remember the seven characteristics of life. I feel like that's going to be stuck in my head for a while now. <laughs> but um, yeah, so just expanding more on what life is. Um, basically, there's a big word called abiogenesis. Um, you guys might have heard of this word, but it's defined to be the natural process um, by which life arises from non-living matter. So like I said, we're made fundamentally of the same chemical elements as non-living things, um, but organic is what is defined to be carbon-based compounds. Um, and they can be formed by non-biological processes, um, but organic for us is um, carbon-based compounds. So like sugar, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, um, those are carbon-based compounds that are the building blocks um, of life as we know it. Um, and so on earth, um, the elements carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen actually account for over 95% of the atoms in the human body and in all known life. And furthermore, um, the four most common elements in the universe are helium, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. Um, and helium is inert, so that's why helium is not um, in life on Earth. Um, so the three most abundant chemically active ingredients in the universe are also 95% of what makes um, the human body and the top three ingredients for life on Earth. So we're not chemically special. Um, it's You can bet that if life is found on another planet, it will probably be made of a really similar mix of elements. Um, if Earth were composed of really rare elements, then it would be safer to assume that we are special and we're something really crazy that happened and life just arose from something crazy, but we came from really, really common elements that are found in the universe. Um, so it's really plausible that these chemical foundations for life are elsewhere in the universe. So um, um, next, um, the <laughs> something that's critical to life on Earth is water. Um, so when we find water here on Earth, um, we have found microbes, um, little, li little, little buddies <laughs> that have found a way to thrive here on Earth, um, even in the desert. But if there's a little bit of water, they can survive there. Um, and without water, life on Earth would probably have never begun. Um, additionally, humans are actually made of 60% water. You guys probably knew that. Um, but also some properties of water make it really important to life. Um, so not only can water nearly dissolve anything, um, but it can also act as a delivery mechanism. So it can give us vitamins um, and nutrients and deliver them to our cells. And it just really helps our body function really efficiently. So um, it's possible that other life life could be could use a different liquid in place of water um, such as methane um, in our own solar system there are lakes of methane on um, some moons and lakes of ethane but um, it's much easier to look for life as we know it and because water is so amazing and it remains liquid for a really um, large range of temperatures from zero to 100 degrees celsius um, it makes it uh, really, really suited for, for making life. Um, so when we search for extraterrestrial life, um, all of the focus falls essentially on water. Okay, now let's move on to the explants. And if you love the feeling of discovery, you might love exoplanets as well. And be prepared because in the end, you learn how to use today's lesson to seek for real exoplanets, undiscovered exoplanets. And yeah, you really can do that. But for now, uh, okay, let's go with this slide. I'm sure all of us are fascinated with the mystery of life, whether life is, exists or, or not, out there in your universe or not. There are also questions such as, are there other planets where we can live? And to answer that, 
exoplanets are a key. But what is really an exoplanet? And it's the, the slide before, please, Victoria. Okay, and the term exoplanet refers to a planet that is outside our solar system. Most of these exoplanets are orbiting a star, but some aren't. And those that, that aren't orbiting a star are called the rogue planets. And yeah, basically, every planet that you find outside our, our solar system, it's called an exoplanet. But how many planets can we find out there? Because, well, the, the answer of that is, what do you think? How many planets do you think we can find out there? Out there? Maybe hundreds, thousands, millions of exoplanets? You can type the answer in chat if you want. I think I remember hearing once that there was enough more planets than there are grains of sand on the earth. Or maybe that was about stars or something, but definitely like billions. Yeah, that's completely true. I also heard that about stars, like there are more stars than grains of sand on earth. And yeah, the, the answer is hundreds of billions. And for me, that's not like an easy number because it has a lot of zeros, but yeah, yeah just keep it with, that we can find, that, that we can find a lot of them, a lot of exoplanets out there. And when we look at the sky, we can see uncountable stars. And the thing is, what's exciting is that there are more exoplanets in our galaxy than stars, meaning that there's at least one planet, one exoplanet of each star in the Milky Way. So I guess there are more exoplanets than grains of salt on Earth. And we know there are many exoplanets, right? But we don't usually see them with the naked eye. So how do we look for them? And yeah, that's pretty interesting. Some of the methods are require a lot of math, but yeah, we don't care about it. They also have technical names, but we'll not go through that. And the first thing you can do is watching for wobbles. And what are those wobbles? When a star and an exoplanet are near, they tend to pull them and you just by the gravitational forces. And yeah, just the, what they're, that, that gravitational forces are doing is pulling to you an exoplanet or a, or a star, they are attracting you. And when these planets or these stars are attracting to you, they emit some kind of light. When they are going towards you, they are gonna see, you are gonna see the light in blue. And where the, when they are going far away, they are gonna see that color in red. And yeah, that's pretty exciting. It's kind of something like when you uh, put some black in a prison, uh, you'll see that we can see some colors like green, yellow, purple, blue, all these colors. And the, the interesting thing is, is that when these wobbles attract, I don't know, uh, when, they, when the Earth attract, for example, the sun, or when an exoplanet attract the star, you are going to see a color. And this color is what astronomers, astrobiologists use, it, use to know that there's an exoplanet. And yeah, you can also, you also have some other options to go to find an exoplanet. For example, you can take pictures. Uh, it's similar to what you do when you are taking a photo with your cell phone, but there's a huge problem and there's a challenge to tackle. It's that you know that stars are so bright. Yeah, and if you have to say what's brighter, a star or an exoplanet, the answer is easy. The stars are brighter than exoplanets. So how 
do you have you ever tried taking a photo of the sun? Uh, just remember to don't look at the sun directly or with your cell phone, but does anyone of you have tried that? Okay, Alexander, you, you have already tried and can you tell us how does it look like? It kind of just whited out the screen. Like uh, I used I used a phone for that and it whited out the screen completely when I took the image. It was like really bright in the center. But like the screen was really bright and you couldn't really tell what was the sun and what was like just light coming off of it. Yeah, that's completely true. And that's exactly what happens when astronomers try taking photos, taking pictures of, the, of, of an exoplanet. And if you have to compare it with something, this, it, there's a lot of light coming through the star. So if you want to find an exoplanet, it's like trying to find a flea in a light bulb that you, you are not gonna see something like this size, you are going to see something that, that's even smaller. And yeah, imagine that <laughs> astronomers, scientists are trying to look for exoplanets, just looking and some tiny dots. Okay, and we also can use gravity lens. And okay, that lenses are just too, too technical, but yeah, you can see in the image that there's the an, an star at the at one part of the image, the upper part, and it's the yellow one. And if you can see, the yellow lines are just the light that it's been emitted. But once that you have an exoplanet, uh, can you? Put, okay, thank you, Victoria. Once that you put an exoplanet, or once that you have an exoplanet, that there's an exoplanet in some place orbiting the star, you can see that it kind of uh, takes, changes the direction of the light. And now while, while studying, when you are studying this, you can see light is going in an unpredictable, well, yes, it's predictable, but, and not expected way. So when the the when the path the path of light changes, you can see that there's something. I don't know if there's an exoplanet or or if it isn't, but there's something that makes the the light change its direction. And then you can know maybe there the, you can see or oh, there is an exoplanet right there. And the uh, another method to find exoplanets is observing minuscule movements. And it's something like wobbles, like the first one watching for wobbles, because here you are also watching for wobbles. But do you remember what are we looking for these wobbles in the first method? or what happened when there's a wobble and then you can know if there's an exoplanet. It's something related with prisons. Yeah, no word. Okay, yeah, I can go ahead, don't worry. <laughs> but yeah, when in the first method, when there's a wobble, you are gonna see different colors of light, uh, whether they are blue or they are red. Maybe some middle point, but uh, usually blue and red. And it depends on whether the star is coming towards you or is going away from you. And what happens with the minuscule movements that is the fifth method is that you are gonna see wobbles 
again, and they can be the same robots. But the thing is that here, you are on, only going to focus on the movement of the star. I, I don't care in this method about the like. I just care about how the direction of the star, how, how, how its orbit change, changes. And that, that's the difference between watching the wobbles in the first method where you, where you are focusing in light and watching the wobbles in the last method when you are focusing on the star's direction. And yeah, they, they are all good, but they are not the most precise method. And we are, we can also search for shadows. And yeah, you are all comfortable talking with shadows because when you go outside and there's the sun at its maximum point, or if, even if it isn't, you can see a shadow in every object. And that's easy because what do you think that could happen when there's a planet coming between the sun and you? Do you think it will make a shadow or don't you think? Or what would you think would happen? Okay, imagine you have the sun and suddenly there's the air coming to the sun. And yeah, do you think that you are gonna see the full sun or do you want, are you gonna see it partially? You can also see that in eclipses uh, when there's something coming, coming between the sun and the air. Or do you think some kind of light is going to be blocked? Yeah, you're probably going to see some like partial blocking of the sun, maybe a shadow that we can look for. Yeah, exactly. It, and that's why it's uh, important this method because just looking by shadows just says what happens in an eclipse. And uh, well, in an eclipse, it's a bigger. Uh, a scenario because uh, you know moon is near to us so we can see it bigger when it crosses between the sun and the air uh, but that that's exactly the exact same that we do when we are looking for exoplanets we are waiting for them to cross between the sun and us the air and when we find a shadow maybe there could be an exoplanet right there but don't worry, we'll go through it deeper and later on. Now we, we can go to the ingredients for light. Okay, sorry, I got lost a little bit there. Um, okay, so um, just to... Uh, Okay, an extension of exoplanets is that some of them are habitable. Um, so um, basically a planet's ability to have life on it and have the life survive there um, is um, controlled by a few things, but a habitable planet is basically one that can sustain life for a significant period of time. So not like the conditions would be right for like five years for life to survive. Um, it has to be like um, millions of years, like it has been on earth. And in the context of the universe, which is really, really old, um, it's like 13.7 billion years old. Uh, it, like a significant period of time is on the order of millions of years. Um, and additionally, the habitable zone is um, the region around a star where liquid surface water can exist on the planet's surface. Um, so uh, uh, Christian will go more in depth on this in the next slide, but I just wanted to add that the definition of habitable um, habitability that we currently have is based on our knowledge that all life requires water. Um, and like I said before, that's what we mainly search for when we search for um, life in the universe. 
Um, and what we define a planet to be habitable is if it has liquid water on it. But if as science develops, maybe we'll find different ways that life can survive and this definition could change. But for now, um, habitable is just um, life as we know it. Um, so yeah. Um, Julia's question, would you consider an icy world with a subglacial open ocean a habitable planet? Yes, we would, as long as there is liquid water, um, we consider it habitable. And we are actually talking about two icy worlds later on in the presentation that have water. Okay, these habitable zones are also known as the Goldilocks zones. And I, I think that you have heard this story about Goldilocks and the three bears, and is something that can, can be related with habitable zones. And here in Mexico, in the story, what Goldilocks eats is soup. But yeah, just let me know in chat, or you can open your mic microphone, whatever you want, in your, uh, in your country's stories. What does Goldilocks eat? Is it soup, ask me, or is it something different? Or maybe there's not that story in your country and it's something different or nothing like that. Yeah, just, just let me know. Oh my God, I think. <laughs> Yeah, it's just porridge, not soup at all. <laughs> okay, I think it's just Mexico is in soup, but yeah, that, that's interesting. Okay, well, now let, let's go to, to the story and why we can consider Goldilocks songs as habitable songs. Do you remember in the story that when Goldilocks ate, there were two plates with soup or porridge? And yeah, she was trying all of them and the one she tried first was, oh no, I don't wanna eat that because it's too hot. And then she moved on to an eggs soup and an eggs porridge and she wasn't eating that because it was too cold. And what happens when, when she eat the third plate, she finished them all up. And why? Because it was just right, you know, it wasn't too cold, it wasn't too hot. It was just right to eat and she hasn't to wait till the soup to cool down or something like that, or it wasn't cold enough so that you can, the, the taste is better. And yeah, you do know that to eat the soup, to, to enjoy a, a plate of soup or porridge, you need the perfect temperature. So that's what happens is exactly in our solar system and in other solar systems. To figure out what this Goldilocks zone is or what habitable zone, we can focus in an example that is about our solar system. And here you can see all the planets from Neptune to Mercury. Well, if you, can, if you consider that the sun is at the right part of the slide, and to have life or to be a uh, habitable zone, you need enough light. And this enough light also can be considered as radiation. And light can also emit heat. So there are some planets that are too cold for us to live. For example, we can go to Neptune, Saturn, and Jupiter. We couldn't live there because they are too cold. Maybe we can figure out some ways to stay uh, a holiday right there in, in, in the near future or maybe in the far future, but they are too cold from us now. And there's also planets that are too hot, in this case, Mercury, because they are near to the sun. But just in the middle, we can see that there are planets that are just right, as in the Goldilocks story, to live on, for example, we can see Mars, Venus, and in the middle of them, we can see the air. And you can uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think they, they can, we can see light right there. Okay. And 
there was someone of you, some of you that say that his favorite or her favorite planet was in the Trappist Guan system. And yeah, that's a pretty interesting system. Uh, do you know something about this system? You can type it uh, on chat if you want. Or what's the, for, for the person? Okay, yeah, Victoria, you, you're right. It has a lot of planets. And there are several exoplanets. Each of them is interesting. It's a, yeah, completely. There are some that are in the Goldilocks zone that are interesting, and there are others that aren't in the Goldilocks zone, but are interesting too. And well, this trap is one system consists on seven planets. And there's an interesting thing about that. It's like most of them are the size, uh, similar size of Earth. And yeah, maybe they could be habitable for us. I don't know. And in this Trappist one system, we can name some planets with letter E, F, and G. And these planets are the ones that are orbiting in the habitable sun. That's pretty interesting. Three planets orbiting the Goldilocks sun. But do you know that these planets are always, are always, always showing the same face to their star? Uh, and that means that in the half of the planet, you will have only day, and in the other half of the planet, you will have only night. It's, it is something as what happens with moon. Like we can really, we can just see one side of the moon. And yeah, you know, that there are a lot of stories about the other side of the moon and what's going on there. But yeah, in these planets, maybe, yeah, we are not completely sure about that, but it's what data says uh, so far, that they, there's some part that only has day and there's other part that's only night. And that's due to the small, the, the small orbits they have. The, the orbits ranging range from, 1.5 days to 25 days. And imagine you just to compare we last orbiting or is or a star more than 300 days. And the the far the, the planet that is farther farther further away from the, the star in this system just completes a spin to the sun in 20 days. So they are really close to the star. And this star is called the Trappist one, and it's an ultra cool dwarf star. But what does that mean of that star? The size about that star is something like Jupiter size. So it's not that big. And yeah, obviously our, our sun is bigger than this star, than Trappist one. But there's something interesting about those ultra cold dwarf stars, and it's that they have something like solar flares where they break a lot more, like 40 time, 45 times the, the break they have. So they are, the, the brightness that they have, it's awesome. And yeah, that could be a problem for the planet's atmosphere and also to life if there was something living there. But yeah, maybe th that's what happened with most of the ultra cool dwarf stars. But just to twist the things a bit, that's not what happens with this star. Because even if more, more stars like ultra cool dwarf stars do that, Trappist one doesn't. And the thing is like, it, it doesn't flare up that much. Maybe it flares up 30 times less than what the common ultra cool dwarf star does. And yeah, maybe there's not a problem at all to, to these planets. And there's a mission, 
that it's going to be launched, that it's the James Webb Telescope, where you can see, where, where we are going to figure out what's happening right there and if there's life there or not. And just to notice, there are, there's a telescope. This is the, the telescope used. It, it's also called TRAPPIST to, to detect this, this system. And there's an interesting thing because they wanna, when they name the telescope, they wanna celebrate the looking for exoplanets, the seeking for exoplanets. So they decided to name it after a Belgium beer. And you can look for it. Uh, there's a, a Belgium beer that's whose brand's name is Trappist beer, something like that. And that's why this telescope is called. Okay, Sasha asked us on what size telescope would you need to see the nearest exoplanet? Hypothetically. Okay, yeah, I didn't know the answer. Like, what's the minimum, si minimum size that you need to see that? But just this telescope that we can see uh, the TRAPPIST system is has a middle of 60 centimeter. So it's not that big. Yeah, that there are, maybe for an amateur telescope, it's a bigger mirror, but considering other telescopes that are located on Earth, I think it's a small mirror. So I don't think that it's that bigger. That, that big, you know, yeah, meaning like extremely large mirror to, to see that. And well, but I, I can figure out later and search for it. Um, oh, yeah, we're gonna do um, an activity now. Uh, we're gonna go into break arms. Oh, there's one more question. All planets in a habitable zone are rocky. Um, as far as we know, I believe yes. Um, uh, we, I will talk about this later, but all of the planets closer to the sun are generally rocky terrestrial planets. Um, and closer to the sun, it's warmer where liquid water can exist and not be frozen. So yeah, generally, um, all planets in a habitable zone are rocky. Um, there are planets that are super far away that have water below a thick layer of ice um, or moons that have that. But um, yeah, that's not in a habitable zone. It just has water. But yeah, okay. So the breakout rooms, um, we are going to um, split up into five breakout rooms. Um, or no, sorry, six breakout rooms. And then we are going to... Your task is to draw an exoplanet, just be really creative and you can just sketch it really quickly on a piece of paper um, and then tell us a story, um, a two minute story about the alien life on that planet. So you can talk about things like what do they eat, drink, do they have families, what do they do for fun, are there predators and prey, like what do the plants look like, um, what colors are there, but yeah, we are going to give you 15 minutes in a breakout room um, to draw and talk with your group about um, the life on that planet. Um, yeah, okay, let me just start breakout room. You can also go to the link I just sent you and there you can see some pages like the Exoplanet Travel Bureau Strange new worlds, universe of monsters, galaxy of horrors. So you can see more ones, uh, some of the most interesting exoplanets that we discovered. And if you want, you can also imagine a completely new exoplanet and talk about all the alien life on that planet. Um, before going to the breakout rooms, do you have any question? Okay, uh, so sorry, I'm just figuring out how to open the breakout rooms. It's not working for some reason. <laughs> uh, um, let me make you a call for us and see whether it will work. Oh, yeah. Okay. 
um, and saviors. So. Okay, you can join your rooms now and we'll give you updates on how much time is left. You should move Anthony and Christian into different rooms uh, because they are going to be bored. Okay. And so same with Joy and Lauren, uh, move them to the uh, rooms with uh, younger students. Okay, I just didn't. So other, otherwise you have uh, YSTs in some rooms and uh, uh, kids by themselves. Um, is it balanced now? And the joy asks, do they do individual ones or one person does the drawing and so on? Okay, I'll broadcast a message. To everyone. Yes. Uh, move Joy or Lauren into room number one. Yeah, Joy is there. And then Lauren is all left alone. So, okay, oh, good. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah that, that, that Addy and Lauren, good. Okay. And room number six, you may want to move yourself there, for example. Or, Christian. Okay, uh, Christian is already in room four. So room number. Uh huh. Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> well, the first one's back. Yeah, we're here early. <laughs> Hi, guys. I'm going to go get my drawing. <laughs> I'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. I hope your visit to other planets was successful. And is Christian back? Yes, Christian. <laughs> so I guess people are ready to share their ideas. They want to meet this.
is there anyone that want to go first? And I can choose random. Okay, yeah, there, there are a lot. I, I just saw Alexandra. Okay, so I was in a group with Jonathan and we created a planet called TB2T. -T T and yes, it's the letters T, B, 2, T. So the people that live on that planet are called, okay, this is a funny name, TBians. And they, they live on a technically plant-based planet. So they live in a giant forest where they live in giant mushroom houses and they used up all of their metal yeah, and it's a utopian planet. They used up all of their metal to have like high tech technology better than Earth's. And they live in giant mushroom mansions. Yes. And since they don't use fire because they are very worried that if they use fire that they're they're going to burn down their whole ha their homes and everything. So if they want to keep themselves warm, they roll their they stay in the sun or uh or they um technically weave a blanket out of grass so i did not save my, the whiteboard we used it on but i have a picture on my phone which i took um a picture of the things we wrote down so technically a normal life on tb2t would be you wake up at dawn never not before not later not before not later you wake up at dawn and technically you stay awake until dusk and usually you are gathering plants or you know or teaching s the kids if you're an adult and if you're a kid you're um having lessons all day but there you're strictly vegetarian and you hate war so so they know about earth they have observed earth and if you work on the technology there and you work like on the big screens that they use um you they you don't like how people on earth hunt for food like use guns and rifles and bows and arrows to shoot down deer and birds and stuff and eat it they and they think very very highly of themselves like they think they're like more sophisticated than anything. <laughs> so um, they use everyday things that humans overlook. Like technically, if you go to the park, you wouldn't say, hey, there's grass, maybe I can use something useful for it. You just sit on it and get a picnic blanket and everything and just have a nice day. But they use their grass to make blankets and keep warm during the night. And they use their wood to make to make furniture and everything. And so since they are awake from dusk till dawn, they fall asleep strictly at dusk and wake up at dawn, like I just said. Uh, favorite food is beans and like beans and technically they eat everything that like that like is edible every plant that is edible except for mushrooms because then they would be technically eating their own houses they wor um insect they worship insects so and so they clean their plants um clean their plants a lot so that to make sure that no insects on it get eaten but they just eat a lot of the, the plants so i don't think i forgot anything about it so yeah thank you that's our planet thank you cool. <laughs> seems I like everyone <laughs> yeah yeah it seems like everyone wants to move there you yeah, want to a question yeah. Oh no, I was just raising my hand if I could go next. Oh. Does anyone have questions for Alexandra? Uh, I'll, if you could call me Sasha, that would be great. Oh, sorry, Sasha. Does anyone have questions for Sasha? Okay, um, Elon, does your group want to go next? 
Uh, yeah, um, so, um, I'll share, um, so, um, this is just a sketch I made of it, so, um, the, I actually used, well, um, it's not a planet, it's a moon, so I used the moon of Neptune, one of Neptune's moons, Triton, um, because I really like it, and so, um, so, like, these are the animals that live on it. They're practically seals, um, but they have both lungs and gills, and they have these bioluminescent lights, because when they go into the oceans, they have to hunt for, um, the other little fish, and so the oceans are very dark, and they also have lots of blubber, because it's super cold on Triton, and so they need to stay warm, and so the reason why there are three of them is because, like, it's a family. And these are the geysers, because there are lots of geysers on Triton, and some of them can reach up to six miles high. And so, like, the favorite food, like, um, there are different kinds of fish. Um, so, um... So, yeah, so there are different kinds of fish that they eat, um, and, um, so their favorite activities, like, they like building snow mounds like these, and they like just sliding on their stomachs, that's, like, their fun thing, and so, like, a typical day is, like, adults will teach the, um, kids, like, how to hunt and stuff. That's practically, like, their school, and, like, yeah, so, yeah, so this is, um, yeah, so I haven't made up a name for them, I'll just name them Tritonians. Awesome name. Yeah, so I was on the same team as Island, and even I made a drawing, so this is the same representation of what I thought about his extraterrestrial creature. So because he said it was bioluminescent, I just made it a bit see-through, you know, the way it's supposed to be. And the, and the yellow boundary is just the light emits. So that's literally a seal <laughs> with gills. So. Thanks so much for sharing that, guys. I really enjoyed um, hearing about these animals. Very creative. Does anyone have questions? I do. I have a question to YSPs, those who study chemistry. What will be bioluminescent in liquid nitrogen? What kind of uh, chemical? Do we have any one with chemistry? Non plants, right? Here. Well, for a future discussion. But cool. Um, does anyone want to go next? Aria? Okay. So um, my group, we made it in a Google slideshow. Um, can I share my screen? Um, yes, you have access to or? I think I do. Okay. Okay. So this is our um, exoplanet. Um, I was in a group with Julia and Lauren. So let me present this. Okay, so our planet is called Boiling Point, um, which is a little spoiler alert because this planet is really close to the sun. Um, so it's ocean, it has ocean. So those oceans are um, constantly, well, boiling above or below the um, boiling temperature of water. And the oceans are not actually blue, they're red because the water has started to rust. So it's like a red hot version of earth, I guess. 
um, in some way. There's also lots of water vapor in the atmosphere from when it starts to boil and probably many ocean currents and bubbles from it during the day. And then the aliens or the animals that live there have super skin or some protective layer that makes them able to live and tolerate really hot water. And um, similarly to plants, well, they can also create energy from the heat they absorb so they don't have to consume any food. Um, they just uh, go into the water and absorb the heat and that's their food. <laughs> Um, the life here also lives on a different time scale, so they work faster, um, they maybe talk faster. So if we go over there, then we'd probably be super slow humans to them. And so here's a little quick visual representation of the exoplanet. It's a red circle that has little red bubbles on it, and they're pools of water. So that is Mark's a planet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. That was really awesome. I liked I liked the graphic. <laughs> Thank you. Also, unlike some other people's planets, ours is probably not that happy and peaceful to live in. So <laughs> does anyone with um, an unpleasant exoplanet want to go next on the theme of harsh planets to live on? <laughs> Maybe Christian, your group? Oh, yeah, Christian? Yeah, if Michael wants, he can go ahead. Okay. Um, so, our planet has two suns. Its name is RP-12A, and it has two animals. One of the animals has a long body, his skin's made of rock, the inside is made of iron, and um, it moves not that fast, but also not that slow. It um, has strong fingers on the bottom because we don't want it burning its whole foot. Just the tip of its fingers um, slowly wear down until it burns its whole foot and dies. Um, and the other animal is basically a moving crystal. It walks very, very, very slowly. Some are found in caves, which they don't have a chance to defend themselves. They will die. Um, others that are found outside, they concentrate the light from, the bo from both of the suns to make like a laser pointer. And that's basically their defense because some laser pointers can burn through metal. And the one, the long one has a very short neck because it doesn't want to burn, um, breaking its neck from the gravity or burning its head on the sun or from the sun. It, it wouldn't burn its head by touching the sun, but it's going to get closer and it will burn its head. The, the um, animals with fingers for toes, they are very big. They're called stompers. And the animals that are made of crystal, a rock, are called rock hards. So, um, the one, the animal with long fingers does not kill, but it will eat dead animals. Um, it eats rocks because the only other animal is a rock. So it eats rocks, it um, keeps it in its body until it needs it. And the animal that's pure rock just um, picks up chemicals from, the, from around the world. There's no water. And both animals die after about 100 days. That was really awesome. Thanks so much for sharing. I love how descriptive you were on all the body parts. Um, um, Mox, did you have a question? I'm sorry. <laughs> Normally, I just forget to lower my hand. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Okay, no worries. Um, okay, I think there's still two more groups who haven't gone yet. Does someone want to volunteer to go next? 
uh, Shaila and Anaya? So, uh, Alexander, could you screen share the thing we were working on in your Minecraft world? Okay, so our world is an ocean world. It's pretty much entirely covered in ocean. There are a few very, very tiny islands. Uh, he's going to show you in like a second, but yeah. So we basically created our ocean world and there's two types of creatures there. Intelligent creatures, one are the axolotls. They're kind of like axolotls on earth, but they're a little different. And they use glowing squid as lanterns and they trade kelp and they eat fish. And then there are their sworn enemies, which are the guardians, which are kind of like giant alien pufferfish that shoot lasers. And they're, they're constantly at war with each other. And they try to avoid each other. And when they run into each other, they try to like destroy each other. But those are the two main intelligent creatures on the planet. And yeah, if anyone else wants to add anything, they can. I was really high up, so I'm going to go in, and you can actually see, possibly, some of these animals at work. Actually, I have something to add. There's uh, one more thing I want to add to uh, about the world that we uh, created. Um, there are glow-in-the-dark squids. Um, so at night, the squids have a dancing competition because that's just fun to have in a different world. And they, there are master guardians. And oh, they're, they're actually yeah. like guardians. Oh. And um, the axolotls use pufferfish as weapons against other animals. So here are some axolotls. Oh. I think I hear a guardian somewhere around here. That's an elder guardian. So these are our different creatures here. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, that's really awesome. Thanks so much for sharing this. This was super cool that you guys made a whole world. Um, Michael, did you have a question? I actually had something to add. In Minecraft's actual lore, guardians are actually machines. So maybe there, there used to be another race that created them to fight. Yeah, possibly. But there are the other form of intelligence, machine or animal. But this isn't part of Minecraft War, so we can leave that aside. Um, is there one more group that hasn't gone yet, or was that everyone? Uh, uh, Joy, did your group go? Yeah, we went. Okay. We were the bioluminescent seals. Ah, uh, yes, of course. Okay. Um, okay, I guess we'll move on. This was really awesome. I'm so glad this activity, um, I'm so glad you guys all enjoyed it. Um, okay, so really quickly before we continue with the topic of exoplanets, 
Um, I thought you guys would just be interested in seeing a research project that I did um, on that TRAPPIST-1 system, which is a system of exoplanets that we are aware of um, in astronomy. Um, it's not all biology that we do for, <laughs> um, it's, there's a lot of physics involved. So basically I made one of my research projects for um, an astro class I had was um, on the, a simulation of the TRAPPIST-1 system. Um, so basically I used really fundamental physics concepts like force, velocity, position, and time functions. And I used Python to code um, those um, I, to code the physics, um, and this was the final um, product. So the middle, that's the TRAPPIST-1 star, and then all of these are the planets. So I just think it's pretty cool to visualize a whole other solar system in our universe. And it looks a lot like ours. So it really makes you think about how special we really are. Yeah. Um, if you guys have any questions about that, uh, feel free to let me know. OK, so um, now we're going to talk about some ways that we look for life as we know it. Um, so for nearby places, such as moons in our solar system, we can actually send spacecraft there, and we call them flyby missions to just kind of pass by and take a look. Um, but for further away places, we can also use spectroscopy, um, like Christian talked about a little bit. And basically, spectroscopy can help you see which chemicals are on the planet, which is super important because we have a ton of chemical reactions going on inside our bodies, and all life on Earth does. So we can try to see if that's going on elsewhere in the universe. Um, another way that we find them is with the transit method. Um, the transit method um, is basically, like Christian said, when a, a planet passes in front of a star, and if you're looking at how bright the star is, um, as the planet passes in front, it gets less bright from our perspective as we're looking at this, the star and the planet together. So basically, um, the decrease in the star's brightness actually can help astronomers figure out the size of the planet. Um, believe it or not, we have some pretty cool equations that help us do that. Um, also, by studying the time between transits, we can figure out how far away the planet is from the star. So essentially, is it in the habitable zone? Um, because its distance from the star controls its temperature on the surface. Um, and if the planet is just the right temperature um, for then it could contain liquid water, which is a really important ingredient for life here on Earth. So we can find out all of this information just with um, this one graph, <laughs> the looking at the changes in the star's brightness. And we have some scenarios where we can see how this shadow forms. And here you can see a graph where the yellow line is just uh, the, the brightness of the star. And you can notice what, that when the exoplanet pass in passes in front of us and the star between them, it, there's a decrease uh, in the star brightness. And yeah, it seems pretty cool, but do you know what will happen if we have different planets with different masses or different sizes? Do you think that shadow will look the same or is it gonna be different? Okay, well, yeah, 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 you are all right. So it's gonna be different. And we can see that in the left video when there's a big exoplanet crossing between Earth, the, the decrease is bigger than the decrease by the small exoplanet. And that's just two planets crossing at different times. But what will happen if they are passing between us and the star at almost the same, the same time? Here we can see that there's just a planet crossing. And yeah, we can see a decrease on the brightness of the star. But when the two, when two stars 
pass and make a shadow, even if they are not crossing at the same time, uh, not, not at the same position, I mean, uh, you can see that it's not that uniform, the decrease of the, the star. In, and that is why, that is because you are blocking more light and you are creating more shadows. And they, 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 those shadows are just adding up so you can see both exoplanets. And with, uh, with this analyzing when a shadow is passing is how you can become a real exoplanet secret. But we'll look for it in a moment. Okay, but there are also problems with the transit method. In, in this image, the, you can see uh, two, two satellites that are, or were looking for exoplanets. And yeah, there's one thing you need to be, you, need, you have to consider, and it's that shadows need to be detected at regular intervals. What does that mean? That you have to see this shadow, this brightness, the star decrease uh, several times. And that's why, that's because uh, imagine that there's crossing uh, at the time you, you are looking at those stars, a comet, and it's gonna show you the exact same uh, decrease. It's gonna create a shadow. And to make sure that there's an exoplanet, that there's possible an exoplanet, you have to see it regular at uh, regular intervals. And it can be the length of year because every year it's gonna pass uh, between you and the star. And when you say it several times, then, then you are gonna say, oh, they may, there might be an exoplanet. So maybe you have to discover a new one. And using this method, the transit method and the wobble method, we can know also the composition of plants planet's atmosphere, if there's hydrogen, if there's water, if there's something like that. And this method is also used in ground-based searches, meaning that you can use uh, telescopes in, on Earth to study or look for exoplanets, but you can also use satellites to look from the space. So far, we have confirmed discovered more than 4,000 with almost, uh, well, more than 7,000 candidates. And from this more than 4,000, more than 3,000 exoplanets were discovered using the transit method. So that's why it is the most popular between uh, the scientific community because it, it has the best results. Um, okay, now we have one more Padlet. Um, so like the icebreaker that we did, um, let me send everyone the link, share comments to clipboard. Um, the question is, would you rather find an exoplanet or visit an exoplanet and why? So personally, I said I would rather visit one um, because I want to see what other planets are like and what it would be like. Um, but it would also be really cool to find one. <laughs> so just go ahead and add those. Um, while we're doing that, um, just because we're running a little bit short on time, I'm just going to really briefly talk about some places that we have found. Um, so after you're done typing, you can just listen and then we'll go back and look at all your answers later. So the first planet, exoplanet that I want to talk about is Kepler 186f. So it's an Earth cousin because it's really similar in size to Earth and it's um, in this, its host star's habitable zone. And like someone asked earlier, um, if all habitable planets are rocky, this one is rocky. And if the planet has has an atmosphere like our own, um, life is a really strong possibility. Um, the next one is Proxima Centauri b, um, which is uh, our stellar neighbor because it orbits the star that's closest to us. Um, and it's 10% larger than Earth and 
rocky again. Um, it, however, one year to make one full revolution it only takes 11.2 Earth days. Um, so that's super close to the planet and super fast, super close to the star. But the host star is a dim red dwarf star. Um, so it's um, still in the habitable zone, even though it's so close. Um, and uh, however, um, there is one issue, which is radiation. Um, when a planet is super close to its host star, it's bombarded with a lot of radiation from the star. Um, but water is actually so amazing. One of its many properties is that it could potentially protect life from radiation. So if there's water on this planet somehow, um, it, life could survive there. Um, so in conclusion, uh, we can detect exoplanets and their habitability um, based on a few methods that Christian and I talked about, like the transit method, spectroscopy, um, and wobbly stars. And yeah, so the habitable zone is the region around a star where liquid water can exist. Um, and two exoplanets that we found are Kepler-186f and Proxima Centauri b. Um, however, what we don't know so far is the atmosphere and the magnetic field um, and more factors that are also really important to life being able to survive. Um, there is also a few places in our solar system that we look, that we know have subsurface um, oceans. So the first one is Enceladus. Um, it's a moon of Saturn. Um, there are some pieces of evidence that indicate that there's a subsurface ocean um, beneath a really thick layer of ice um, and organic molecules are present. So. The three pieces of evidence are, firstly, um, there are these things called plumes that shoot out from at really, really high speeds, like 400 meters per second um, out of the subsurface ocean. And um, a flyby mission actually found water vapor, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide, and organic material in those plumes. Um, we also found silica nanograins in Saturn's E-ring, so one of Saturn's rings, and these nanograins can only be made at temperatures above 90 degrees Celsius, so that points to hydrothermal vents, really hot vents on the ocean floor of this subsurface ocean, um, and we actually have those on Earth. Um, it's hypothesized that that's where life began on Earth, at, in the hydrothermal vents. Um, and lastly, uh, scientists, this isn't a really a piece of evidence but for ocean, but scientists did find a methanogen called M. okinawensis that could potentially survive beneath the ice. Um, they essentially recreated the conditions on um, in that ocean on Enceladus, and it could actually colonize the ocean floor. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so summarize Enceladus, which is a moon of Saturn, has a subsurface ocean with plumes that contain organic molecules and volatile gases. Um, additionally, silica nanograins, these little tiny silica pieces, were found in one of Saturn's rings, which means there may be hydrothermal vents on the seafloor. And lastly, a methanogen that is alive here on Earth would actually be able to colonize the ocean floor there. Um, the last place I'm going to talk about today is Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter. Um, and it also has, there are some pieces of evidence that point to a subsurface global ocean. Um, so the first, first thing is that a magnetic field was detected um, within Europa and it's hypothesized that a salty ocean creates this magnetic field. Um, additionally, the surface doesn't have many craters. Um, like the moon, it has a lot of craters because it's constantly being like bombarded with little meteorites. Um, so it's hypothesized that warmer ice could be rising um, and erasing those craters. Or craters. Um, and where does that heat come from? Uh, tidal flexing. So when a planet is orbiting a star um, and it's moving around, uh, the force of gravity come, it creates this like push and pull game as it's orbiting. And it's actually, because the sun is so much more massive than the little, uh, sorry, the moon is, uh, the planet is so much more massive than the moon. Um, the moon is actually flexed a little bit as it's moved around and squished depending on its orientation. And that inner heat um, is able to, um, well, that is able to create that energy that heats up the moon. So that's hypothesized where that heat is coming from and maintain the liquid ocean that's so important to life. 
Um, so to summarize, uh, Europa has shown evidence of um, a salty subsurface ocean of liquid water and tidal flexing may be creating that heat inside of Europa, which maintains the liquid ocean. Yeah, and here's the question that we told you before is, do you want to become an exoplanet seeker? And the answer is yes, you can, but you only need a satellite. And yeah, that may be tricky because uh, I, I'm, I'm telling you that you need a satellite, but how are you gonna look a satellite? And let me tell you which one is the satellite you need. And this is the this one that is this telescope. That, uh, I'm sorry, the, this satellite. Uh, Victoria, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, this is the satellite you need. How are you gonna get that? That's that's the main point about it. And yeah, you can use that. Uh, this is called the this satellite. And we can see in the next slide what it's it is for. And this is the the program that you can go to. And if you want, you can uh, no, uh, note what's the name of the project. And it's, it is a science citizen project. And it's called Planet Hunter Test. You, you are going to analyze some data. You can do it. And you are going to tell if there can be an exoplanet or if there couldn't be an exoplanet. And yeah, just let me tell you about this satellite a little bit more. And with, with this satellite, the, the objective, the, the main goal of this is to find thousands of new undiscovered plan, exoplanets using the transit method that we have already talked about. And in the next slide, we can see how is this data given to you. And okay, the, here is the data. And yeah, here are some letters with some colors like B, D, yellow, red, green colors. And it is something like what we, we have already shown you. Uh, in our examples, you, can, you saw some lines that were when the brightness star decreases. And this is the same, yeah, just that they are using dots instead of lines. And it's not with the test. Um, satellite bodies with the Spitzer Space Telescope, but it's something I like what you will find if you go through, through this project. And I see that Aria has already done that. And yeah, is it cool? Yeah, it's actually a lot of fun. Um, it's pretty easy to do, so you can go through a lot of them um, pretty easily. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, well, now it is time for a really brief Kahoot. Krishna, I shortened it a lot. Um, but first, let me just go back and let's look at the answer um, to uh, would you rather find an exoplanet or visit an exoplanet? Arya said, why not choose both? Sasha said, find one. Those are good reasons. Shyla said, visit one. Be cool to explore. Find one. Wow, pretty even mix. <laughs> okay, well, now we're gonna play the Kahoot. So, play, oops, don't like it. <laughs> answers. Uh, okay, so everyone go to um, kahoot.it and then you can join it on your phone or on your laptop, but just make sure you can see my screen as well as your whatever screen you're answering the questions on. Uh. Does anyone have questions? So the code is 
six nine two seven if anyone is having trouble oh also i will share um our slides with everyone in case you guys wanted to access all of this um access all of the links that we had in our presentation. i'm joined you joined Okay, does anyone still want to join and has not joined yet? ISP students also feel free to join. Oh, they all joined? Okay. Okay, last chance, please unmute and tell me to wait if you still want to be added. Lauren, Christian, Anthony. Go ahead. <laughs> Enjoy. Oh, we can play too? Sure. Yeah, oh, okay. everyone can play. Oh, okay. okay. Give me one second, guys. No worries. Okay, who put it? Mm -hmm. um, Christian, while we're waiting, do you want to quickly talk about the optional homework? Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, we prepare for the optional homework. If you want to do it, it's just about the global method that we uh, present. And yeah, if, if you don't remember, is when you get some different colors about something when I start is going away or going towards you. And yeah, the step one is just to build the spectrometer, a spectrometer. And here you can find the first link. It's the link to the template of this. Then you, ju you just have adding for the instructions. And even if you have trouble doing that, there's also a link where you can see how it is done just someone assembling uh, an spectrometer. And well, the step two is you have to point, uh, next slide, please. Uh, you have to point a, a target to the spectrometer attached to a cell phone. And well, the, the materials you need are just only like paper, some cardboard and a CD, DVD. And yeah, you will uh, attach it to a cell phone and point to a target. But yeah, just be uh, take care of that because you you have to make sure that you never look directly at the sun through the spectrometer or even without the spectrometer. And but you can be creative. You can uh, point to clouds, to the sky, to like bulbs, lanterns, water, coffee, whatever you think would be interesting. You can be creative and yeah, that won't be hard for you because you are a scientist. So that won't be a problem. And the step three is just to take a photo of what you can see through, through this. And yeah, see if you can uh, point in at different targets, you get the same spectrum of light or if that uh, is, if it changes, why does it change? And can you uh, study planets or start analyzing their spectrum? And what do you think what, what you can learn from it? And it will be great if you can send us your pictures for us of what you find. So feel free to do it. It, it will take a time, maybe. It's not a lot because you just have to build, uh, maybe download the template, um, print it, and then build it, and yeah, just take some photos. So feel free to do it. And if you do, do so, send us what you have found. OK, thanks, Christian. We're going to start the Kahoot now. I think there's 10 questions. 
oh, 11. What age of the universe is generally accepted by scientists? I mentioned this really briefly at the beginning. <laughs> Take your time. Yeah, 13.7 billion years. Nice Elon's on top. What is the correct order of our planets in our solar system? Nice. My very educated mother just served us nachos. That's how I remember it. Okay. What kind of planets are closer to the sun? Okay, there is only two right answers for this one, two wrong ones. Uh, oh, actually, I think, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry if you chose hot ones, that should have been one of the correct answers. <laughs> that is my bad, I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, what is the name of the rover that most recently landed on Mars, if anyone knows this? Perseverance. Curiosity is the old one. Nice. Good job, Sasha. If there is life on Enceladus, where does it most likely live? Enceladus is the moon of Saturn. Awesome. Everyone got it right. Joy's moving up. All right, how do we look for exoplanets? Everyone got it right. <laughs> All of these are. All right. What is the definition of a habitable planet? Yes, one that can sustain life for a long period of time. That's the definition. All right, what is the habitable zone? All right, the distance from a star where liquid water can exist. Wow, everyone's on fire right now. Which factors are important when considering a planet's habitability? All of the above, yep. The planet size, atmosphere, and distance from the host star. What is a super habitable planet? If anyone knows this, we did not talk about it. We did not have enough time. <laughs> A planet that is even more suited for life than Earth. Really awesome that some of you guys knew that or guessed that. Okay, last question. Did Victoria and Christian enjoy getting to know all of you? Thank <laughs> you.
Everyone gets it right. Okay. Third place, Joy. Second place, Elon. And first place, with all questions correct, Sasha. All right. Oh, and runners up, Kadambari and uh, Ju Julia. Okay. Thank you guys so much for joining us today and seeking some exoplanets with us. Um, I really, really enjoyed getting to know you. And I dropped the link to the presentation in the chat. Wow. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. We are also going to save all the links that we mentioned also, in the presentation. Also, are we going to get the recordings? Uh, sorry? Are we going to get the recordings? I'm not sure. Julia, are we going to get the recordings? Yes, yes, of course. It will take some time to process the recordings, but I hope to put them in the oh, okay. Slack channel oh. uh, tomorrow. Okay, so you'll be sending us an email with them? Or it will be in Slack channel. The link will be in Slack channel. Yes. Oh, okay. Really okay. Bye. Really Thank you. Yes, you're very welcome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. I enjoyed talking to you. Me as well. Thank you so much, Victoria. Christian. Good job. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was yes. a great presentation. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my gosh, Jonathan's message. <laughs> yeah, those guys are awesome, Julia. They are very creative. They're wonderful. Yeah. Yes. They're... Yeah, I love their ideas. Mm -hmm. I, I, so... I just have one doubt uh, before <laughs> anything else. Uh, is Michael the guy you? told us that he loved dinosaurs. So, so what's the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that in one of the previous meetings, you told us that there was a guy that loved dinosaurs and mm -hmm. that he learned a lot of things, how to come, colors, everything with dinos dinosaurs. Oh, no, that was a different one. No, ah, OK, but... OK. <laughs> yes, but. Uh... They are all wonderful, like very smart, very curious, very eager to learn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I could really notice that. And they know a lot too. So, but still, Victoria, I just wanted to tell you in the very beginning, I think when you were introducing new terms, terms like uh, you probably went just a little bit too fast for them because some of them asked me in private chat and told me that mm -hmm. I, I, I cannot follow that fast because lots of new words and not all the kids come from the United States. Some kids come from other countries, so English is not their first language. So it takes them just a bit longer to process the information. So when you introduce um, a new word that is completely new to them, it may help, you know, just to stop on that and just give an example, maybe an extra example, or check whether they actually do understand. Or maybe when you are talking about like what is life, how would you know the property or properties of life and so on, maybe it would be good to get something from them first and then build on what they said. But just just the minor comment here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the feedback. Just because you don't know these particular kids and their background, where, where they come from. They come from all over the place. So, we have kids, I think uh, in July, um, in the last class, we, would, we should actually share where we're all from and um, ask the kids to share. It, it's very interesting that kids all over the globe are interested in astrobiology these days, which is absolutely amazing. Well, thank you so much. I know it was two hours. It was probably tiring. Uh, <laughs> no, no. <I'm> <laughs>
<laughs> it was great to be here. Like I, I also learned a lot from them. Uh-huh. And yeah, I, I got surprised also by what they did when we asked them to imagine. Yeah, that they have different approaches since Minecraft to drawing and yeah, maybe you see you uh, do an infographic, something like that. And yeah, that, that was wonderful. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I was kind of uh, worried in the beginning because you didn't actually tell them what to use to, to build their planet, right? And what media was thinking, should we give them some suggestions like uh, share uh, a Google slide or go to some uh, platform where you can share and draw together, build together, but see, they, they figured it out by themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they did whatever they prepared. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. We'll talk more about it on Monday. So otherwise, please, we'll ask you to share uh, your experience so they will know what to prepare for. So the things that you liked, something that you expected, what you didn't expect, what suggestions you will get to those who will be teaching next Friday, and so on, something about that. I'll send you um, some uh, questions as well, but yeah, feel free to add them to this. Okay, right, and um, can we also send you a list with all the links so they can yes. access them better? Okay, yes, yeah. that would be very helpful. And you may want to look through the uh, chat to see what questions they've asked you and actually reach out to otherwise please if you don't know the answers and think you know, of how to answer the, those questions the best. So okay, look, so, so they have a channel on Slack. Yes, yes, you, 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 you have questions in chat, right? And you will have the recording. I, I will. It, it takes some time to process in, in Zoom, but hopefully by tomorrow it will be done. I'll, I'll put it uh, into okay. the Slack channel. Of the recordings. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It was great. Thank you. Wonderful. See you. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you. You too.